I just want to take a quick few moments to say we've got the protocols, I mean, just about completed. So we've actually been in there the last four hours kind of going over things. So hopefully within, what are we saying, 60, 90 days, hopefully, we'll have that, we'll finally be done. So I just wanted to mention that to you all. All right, so now we're going to talk about uh, some actual cases uh, that we've had. Uh, we're going to talk about strokes. Um, you know, we did a case review last year on strokes. Uh, we saw some improvement <coughs> on documentation and things like that after the case review. Uh, here uh, recently, Bruce came and said, that, you know, we needed something else and documentation on doing strokes and whatnot, so I put something together and see if it'll help out. Alright, All right, so the Cincinnati Stroke Scale, this is what we use on every patient that we suspect is having a stroke. Uh, facial droop, is it normal? Both sides of the face move equally? Is it abnormal? <coughs> One side of the face does not move as well as the other. How would you? Cody's got orders to check me morning and evening. <laughs> Thank you, Cody. That's Appreciate nice. you taking care of how. Arm drip. Have the patient close their eyes and hold their arms out for 10 seconds. And normal, should both arms move the same or both arms do not move at all? Abnormal, one arm does not move or drifts down compared to the other. Okay, so we want to make sure that if 10 seconds with their eyes closed and, you know, watch if they're peaking, if their arm drifts off, that's a positive uh, sign. Speech. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. If it's normal, the patient uses correct words with no slurring. If it's abnormal, the patient slurs words, uses the wrong words, or is unable to speak at all. Unable to speak at all is also a positive sign. So here is the Cincinnati Stroke Scale that the American Heart Association puts out, and this is what we go by. And one of the things that we started talking about is if you have one positive on the Cincinnati stroke scale, arm drift, yes, slurred speech, no, uh, the other one, no, is that a positive Cincinnati stroke scale or is that a negative? Well, we were seeing people put, you know, one of the three, they had a positive finding, but in their vital signs, they were putting negative on Cincinnati stroke scale. And that's where this came up. Of, well, if you have one, if you're saying one of them is positive, then your Cincinnati stroke scale has to be positive. And the AHA says if any one of these three signs is abnormal, the probability of a stroke is 72%. And I think if you have two, isn't it like 89%? So if you have two, it's 89%. So if you have any one of these three that is positive in your chief complaint, then in your uh, vital signs, your Cincinnati stroke scale should be positive. Uh, pupil response. <coughs> you know, we talk about the pupils. Uh, you know, this is mainly talking about dealing with bleeds. If you see, you know, abnormal pupils. <coughs> I don't, have you all ever seen abnormal pupils with a uh, ischemic style stroke? Have you ever seen one? It's not the typical presentation. You more think about a bleed and some kind of pressure on one of the, the <coughs> third nerve nucleus or something that controls the pupils. So occasionally, but most of the time we see pupil response, we, you know, in unequal pupils we think of an actual bleed. Uh, a ferric pupillary defect as detected by the swing flashlight test, you know, uh, here's some examples of, here, there's normal, the pupil stays, you know, going back to the flashlight swing, going nice and easy, not putting a lot directly into the pupil, and making a nice easy motion to see if you have changes in the pupil. Don't want to be blind to them. Uh, here's a slide that shows like pupillary light response, how you could have uh, changes in you know, midbrain, you could have 
make put, uh, <coughs> position or fixed uh, diffuse effects of drugs, metabolic things like that can cause small drow uh, drowsy pup uh, pupils. Uh, just areas of the brain that could affect each kind of pupils that you may see. Damage or compression of the ocular motor nerve by an aneurysm or brain herniation can also cause mydriasis, typically associated with ptosis and uh, ophthal. That one. <laughs> Couldn't say it when I put it in there and I can't say it now. Uh, Myodrus is dilation of the pupil. Uh, ptosis is the drooping or falling of the upper or lower eyelids. And that word Dr. Troutman said refers to weakness or paralysis of one or more extraocular muscle which are responsible for eye movement. It is a physical spining in certain neurological illnesses. Uh, if you don't want to use a, uh, a flashlight or a, a pin light, this is Pupil Math 101. If you want this, I'll get this for you. This is the formula to figure out what pupils are doing. It's in the new protocol. It's in the new protocol. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking for uh, different things and I saw this, uh, saw this picture and I thought, oh my God, <coughs> what in the world are you, really? <laughs> Who would do this? Ah, so this is the video we're going to watch. We're going to talk about some uh, pupillary response. <laughs> Dude's got an accent, so it's quite funny. <coughs> Hi, difference in pupil size is termed amysochoria. Based on clinical findings, it can be divided into three groupings. First is an abnormally large pupil. This is obvious in normal lighting, but less so with the lights off, because the other, normal pupil, dilates. Next is an abnormally small pupil. This may not be visible in normal lighting, but with the lights off it becomes obvious due to dilation of the normal pupil. Finally is pupil asymmetry up to 2 mm that doesn't change in light or dark. Both pupils change size, but the relative difference remains the same. This is present in up to 20% of normal people and termed physiological anisochoria. Both eyes respond normally to light. Back to the abnormally large pupil, termed amadriasis. The autonomic nervous system controls pupil movement with constriction supplied by the parasympathetic fibres which travel with the third cranial nerve. Loss of the parasympathetic signal causes the pupil to dilate. Look, therefore, for diplopia or ptosis to suggest a third nerve palsy. This can be caused by berry aneurysm compressing the third nerve, which can accompany and occasionally precede subarachnoid hemorrhage. Here, the affected right eye is dilated, down and out, with a ptosis. A dilated pupil without ptosis or diplopia is unlikely to arise from a third nerve palsy. See the video on third nerve palsy. Another cause may be a dystonic pupil. This is characterised by a dilated pupil with little response to light, but which may slowly constrict to a commutative effort and relax slowly as well. Aedes pupil is presumed to be post-viral denervation of the pupil sphincter and is common in young women. <coughs> Slit lamp examination may reveal segmental paralysis and flattening of the pupil border, giving rise to a pupil with an irregular shape. There may also be a vermiform movement of the non-paralysed sections of the iris, literally a worm-like constriction effort. Aedes pupil is confirmed by testing with dilute pilocarpine 0.125% eye drops, which shows constriction within 20 minutes. But this denervation supersensitivity usually takes some weeks to develop after the onset of the Aedes pupil. Although tonic pupil is usually idiopathic, they may also arise in diabetes, giant cell arteritis, and syphilis, where they are usually bilateral, small, and termed argyle robertson pupils. Blunt trauma to the eye may tear the pupil sphincter and cause a permanently dilated pupil, clinically similar in appearance to an Aedes pupil. Diplopia after trauma is suggestive of a blowout fracture. Acutely look for an associated high femur, and later for angle recession or retinal dialysis. Previous eye surgery may also have damaged the pupil. 
Acute glaucoma features a fixed, mid-dilated pupil with brow ache, blurred vision and nausea or vomiting. The cornea is hazy upon slit lamp examination with a very high intraocular pressure. Finally, the commonest cause of a dilated pupil is exposure to dilating drugs. Examples include the eye drops atropine, cyclopentolate and tropicamide. Atropine may dilate the pupil for up to two weeks. Gardeners may inadvertently expose themselves to atropine when cutting back the deadly nightshade or belladonna plant. They present with a dilated pupil, blurred vision and slight photophobia. The pupil is widely dilated and doesn't respond to pilocarpine 1%, but does resolve over a few days. Now, to the abnormally small pupil, autonomic control of pupil dilation is by the oculosympathetic pathway. This arises in the hypothalamus, descends the brainstem and cervical spinal cord, ascends the cervical sympathetic chain and carotid plexus, and passes through the cavernous venous sinus with the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve. Damage along this pathway is termed a Horner syndrome and features a small pupil or meiosis, slight ptosis, and a loss of sweating or anhydrosis on one side of the face. Confirmatory testing with aproclonidine drops reverses the anisocoria and often the ptosis too. See the video on Horner syndrome for more details. Causes of a Horner syndrome include carotid artery dissection, which is both life threatening and treatable with anticoagulation. Other causes of a small pupil are current or previous iritis and current or previous pilocarpine eye drops. Some key points once more. Anisocoria may arise due to a lesion impairing the efferent sympathetic or parasympathetic pathway to the eye, or due to factors within the eye itself. The pupil should be examined in both light and dark with distance fixation. Ask about eye trauma or surgery, use of eye drops and gardening. With the dilated pupil, check for ptosis, diplopia, and response to dilute and 1% pilocarpine. With the small pupil, confirm Horner syndrome with aproclonidine drops and investigate further urgently. I had to put it in there. All right, so let's look at a few reports. Uh, shouldn't see any kind of uh, information here about anybody's reports, whose it is or anything. I just wanted to kind of emphasis on putting this in the report. Chief complaint, stroke, CVATA, arm droop, yes. Facial droop, no. Slurred speech, no. So when you do a Cincinnati stroke scale, it should be positive, exactly. Okay, once again, we were seeing people put negative with only one finding, and it doesn't matter. If you have one finding of the three, it's a positive Cincinnati stroke scale. Uh, in your impression, you should always have, you know, if on scene notica notification was done, did you notify them at, uh, on the scene? If all possible, do that. Uh, and in, in your impression, unable to assess arm drift secondary to patient, uh, unable to follow commands, unable to assess slurred speech secondary to uh, patient not responding when spoken to. I mean, the, the crew member documented reasons why in their impression of what they saw the patient not being able to do. Under vital signs, uh, Patient noted to be uh, lying on the cot in no acute distress, Cincinnati stroke scale positive. On both of these, the Cincinnati stroke scale was positive. Uh, this one, they actually had unequal pupils. The crew member documented that. Uh, the left pupil was a four, the right was a five. Uh, the react, uh, reaction dilation, normal, normal. Uh, under assessment, this crew member actually broke down the report and put in each section of a little something under each comment, which is really nice, especially when you're talking about doing a stroke and putting, you know, patient was noted to have a weak grip strength noted to the right arm. I mean, you're saying what part of the body exactly, exactly is affected. So that's, that's good documentation to put that. Uh, one thing, reason I pulled this is, what do you see strange about this one? You have positive here, positive here, positive here, negative down here. Is that possible? Absolutely possible. But, you know, there was nothing in the report that said why this happened. If you're going to have this, you know, at least document what happened 
to make it turn from positive, positive, positive to a negative. You know, we talked about that in the uh, medical protocol update is that it is possible that someone have a TIA and all symptoms resolve right in front of you. That is perfectly okay. It's probably good for your patient. But if you have something like this, you know, document why you had a change. Uh, it, you know, corresponded to an assessment plus documenting your vital signs of what made that change to make you go from positive, positive, positive to negative. I think there was, like the very first one says arm movement left none, then all the other ones say spontaneous. Yeah, that, it was so different it, ones. Oh, those were good. Yeah, it, these are just, all these are different reports. This gotcha. is no one's <coughs> report. I just pulled different documentation. Alright, so now we're going to talk about some case studies. I'm going to talk about some case studies, what we would do in each one of these situations, and then I've got the outcomes of actually what happened to each one of these uh, patients. So you arrive on scene to find an 87-year-old male with chief complaint of a gradual onset of left-sided numbness. He states that this started 30 to 45 minutes prior to EMS arrival. Left-sided numbness. Arm drift. When he does the test, his, arm, his arms stay up. It's not, he doesn't have one drift, so <clears throat> arm drift, no. Facial droop. You have him smile, everything looks normal. No, ch no uh, changes there. Slurred speech. You have him say the old new dogs, new tricks, old dogs, new tricks. He has no problem saying it, and everything's fine. So would, what would we document on this one? It's a negative Cincinnati stroke scale. It, no history. He denies any history whatsoever. Assessment. When you get to do an assessment, his airway is patent. His breathing is normal. Circulation pulse is normal at the radial site. Uh, his A and O times person, place, and time and event. Neurosensory motor is completely normal. Blood and fluid, uh, uh, blood and fluid loss is absolutely none. Here's his vital signs. Blood pressure 138 over 72. Pulse of 90. Respiration is 18. Sat to 96% of room air. His pupils are equal. His blood sugar is 151. No major changes in vital signs during transport. His Cincinnati stroke scale is negative. What do you think is what? Do, what's your impression on this guy? What's wrong with him? Possible sick person. He has no altered mental status, no arm drift, no facial drooping, no slurred, no slurred speech, and throughout patient care, he's non-febrile. Okay, so everything you're, every, I mean, everything looks completely normal with this guy. So what kind of treatment do we do? O2. How many give nasal cannula? How many give an honor breather? Will this guy do with the nasal cannula? Absolutely. IV. Does he need fluids or does he need an INT? INT, does he need an IV at all? Not necessarily. I mean, nothing in there said he needs it, you know, says he needs an IV. Cardiac monitor, 12 leads or just monitoring? 12 lead? He's old. He's old. Yeah. Go ahead and do one. Transport priority, code one or code three? Code one. I'll put it on there. No, go back. All right, so this guy here, Do you call this in as a code stroke? No. No, no coach stroke. <laughs> All right, so upon arrival, the same findings as EMS documented, the exact same findings. Uh, coach stroke activated, yes. The EC the, or the doctor in the ER, he decided to, talking to the crew, you know, he decided to go ahead and activate a coach stroke. You know, apparently there was something else said that, you know, just wasn't right. So it was activated at the ER? Activated at the ER. Um, so, I'm sorry, what was the initial call for? Numbness. Numbness to his left. Arm yep, arm, arm numbness, mm -hmm. left-sided numbness. <clears throat> so they did a CT, and it was negative. 
and they did um, neurology arrived they did the patient had no contraindications TPA they did TPA the guy and had complete resolve of everything the numbness was gone of course that was his only complaint now is it possible that uh, you know I think they put it in there as, as secondary to a TIA they just knocked the TIA out but could that have been something worse I mean you know the, uh, would it have led to something worse I think the crew did a very good job on documenting on the report on talking about you know they showed uh, they could have just put that patient in the truck and took him to the hospital they took care of the patient yes they started an INT on the guy they drew blood on the guy they did they were you know a patient advocate and it paid off for the patient so that was a good job on that one what was it that they saw I guess that I mean, other than the left side of the I mean, do we know what it was that they passed along that may have triggered the stroke activation because the left side of the is kind of vague I'm, I'm kind of with you on that I don't know I didn't see the physician report did you, you tell us what hospital it was this is all you can see because honestly, on that, I don't think it's all nine and one for this left sided numbness. They're pretty. I think what it was was the crew documented and put in their sudden onset. If I was guessing, sudden when you know, anytime someone says a sudden onset, we get suspicious about things, correct? Yeah. So I guess when the crews told the doctor it was a sudden onset. Yeah, I mean, what, what's kind of strikes me about this case I think as far as what EMS did it was perfect I don't think they needed to be a code stroke you know once that maybe that decision was made in the hospital that's kind of a, in a different time but I know the documentation said there was no numbness now we've all seen patients well I've got numbness but when you check them you really don't appreciate the numbness maybe there was just some incredible numbness noted in the ER you know typically we think of code stroke or giving TPA and somebody with some kind of motor issue it's not to say that you can't give it for sensory, but TPA has lots of risk. And oftentimes it won't be given in sensory. Now, if this was a complete, I mean, there was just no sens sensory on the entire side of the body, that's my guess as to what the neurology folks saw, and that's why they decided to go ahead and give it. I'm just guessing there. Well, you don't have any more information, do you? And I guess they did do the MRI, which showed evidence of a evolving... Isn't that correct? If you can read what's on there. I think. Wasn't there a mention? I didn't get to review this. Or was there not a. No, or no, MRI was negative. So, I don't know. Judgment call by the neurologist. Isn't it? I mean, they're, they're the experts. That's why we get them on board for something like this. To, emergency physician had the question so activated it and neurologist made the decision to go forward. Any comments on it? No. Can I see it real quick? I mean really lately too, I mean as long as there's not any contraindications, they're really going ahead and giving it unless there's anything that otherwise would cause intracranial bleeding. Um, that's what we've been seeing, and we've been giving it a lot for TIAs. And that's not necessarily, there's 20% of uh, MRIs and CTs too that after the TPA is given, you may never have a positive finding on an MRI. That's not saying that that's what happened here, but if you're breaking up that clot, you think about it 24 hours later, you get an MRI. If you broke up the clot, it's not going to be there. Um, that happens at about 20%, depending on the, the amount of damage. So. What we're seeing now more is that the more research that comes out with TPA, it's safe as long as there's no contraindications, is if there's anything, even if it is numbness or just kind of an isolated um, neurological deficit, then they'll go ahead and give it because the risk of, of living with that versus being able to do something about it. So, um, and this was Dr. Peel, so. It says uh, Dr. Peel noted that the patient was experiencing numbness and weakness to the left side. Mm. Just semantics on the wording. 
patient was noted to have less left sided paresthesia associated with horizontal nystagmus bilaterally, bilaterally in dissymmetry to the left side. So. Or got worse. I mean, the weakness could have, you know, very yeah. well while we were transporting, yeah. it wasn't there. But, yeah. you know, st stroke is an evolving process. And that's what we see a lot if they are activated after y'all drop them off is they now they've been sitting in a room for 10, 15 minutes and then they go in there and now we've got weakness and we have some other things. So, so that was good. So that's perfect. Thank you. Any questions about that one? Case study two. He arrived on scene to find a 47-year-old male found alert but disoriented. Per bystanders, subject was working when he leaned against the wall. Bystanders also tell you that they felt that he might have had a headache due to him rubbing his head just prior to doing this. Arm drift, yes. Facial drift, no. Slurred speech, no. All right, so is this a positive? Okay, it's positive. <coughs> Unknown on his history. On assessment, his airway is patent. Uh, his breathing is normal. Circulation is strong, but irregular radio pulses. I thought that was I thought that was really good that they documented that irregular radio pulses. Uh, LLC was alert and disoriented. Open eyes, but unable to speak to make eye contact. So he's unable to speak. But remember, on the deal, it says unable to speak when spoken to. So that makes it a positive finding right there. Uh, CNS weakness noted to the upper and lower extremities on the right side. The left side uh, is normal. On the circulation, why would it be important that irregular radio pulse would be going on? Exactly. So. His vital signs. Blood pressure was 200 over 100, pulse was 120, respiration was 14, sats for 97% of Romero. Pupils are noted to be left of 4 and right of 5. They uh, do react to light. His blood sugar is 151. No change of vital signs during transport, and it's a uh, positive sensitivity stroke scale. Okay. Alert and disoriented to his surroundings. This is your impression of what you see. Uh, weakness to the right side, no facial drooping, although he, uh, although do notice drool on the right side of, his, of the mouth. Unable to assess speech due to the patient not responding when spoken to. That makes it a positive finding. Treatment, oxygen. We're going to give him oxygen? If so, what are we going to give him? Non rebreather or cannula? 97%. 97%. Can you? I'm good with that. IV, fluid or INT? INT. INT. No, I get it. Did you say he was working out? Big I always want to know the temperature. Two. His temperature two. Did I have it on there? Two. Oh. I didn't see temperature. BP is two hundred over one. Two hundred over hundred. Pulse one twenty. So. Okay. Fluids, INT, it, it, it's kind of toss. Someone said because he'd been working outside, give him some fluids. Nothing wrong with that. Cardiac monitor, we're going to do a 12 lead or just monitor? 12. 12 lead, absolutely. Transport priority, code one or code three? Code three. Code three. All right. This patient came to the ER. On arrival, taken straight to CT. A pop, uh, yeah, since they, uh, they did activate on scene. Uh, <coughs> he was negative for any hemorrhage, and the risk and benefits were explained. The family decided to administer the TBA. Uh, the following day, the patient showed minimal improvement in neurological symptoms, and the patient was scheduled to have a repeat CT scan later that afternoon, 24 hours post TPA. On 426, the patient uh, CT showed the patient to have a large acute hemorrhage to the left 
middle cerebral artery infarct with a midline shift of 13 millimeters. <coughs> Neurosurgery was consulted and the patient family desired a patient to have surgical intervention to correct the mass effect. The patient was taken on 426 to have an emergent uh, craniocomy. patient was intubated post procedure on 51. The patient was noted to be awake. Overall mental status fluctuates. So, you know, not to, <coughs> that one didn't work out as well. I mean, uh, <laughs> when we think about the TPA, you know, like one of the questions, or we talk about the side effects. What's the big side effect? You're bleeding. Now, some people will argue, well, like, let's say in this case, if we hadn't given the TPA, was he going to bleed anyways? And that's something that's very hard to ever ascertain. But that's, we usually look at those kind of risk and benefits, and you saw beforehand, I mean, this guy is, what, 40-something years old, not talking, not hardly moving. You know, what kind of quality of life is that? You know, and, and I don't know now what kind of they're citing on the risk of hemorrhage, but, you know, it's well less than 10%. You probably know a better number than I do. But so let's take that 80%, 90% chance that we reverse part or all that to where we want to send mom and dad's home. So that's kind of the thought process there. And sometimes people have to be the negative statistic, unfortunately. Did it show up? Yeah, no, I think it was appropriate, justified. If this was my family member and I was there, I'd say, yeah, we, let's, do the, let's do it. Do the TPA. The only thing to me that could have been is with his overall depth that you have to think how much area of the brain is affected. And one of the contraindications is if you have more than one third of the brain affected, then you're at a higher risk for intracerebral hemorrhage. So that would be the only thing that I could kind of nitpick in this is when you're looking at how, what overall his stroke scale, what his deficits were, how large the area of ischemia probably was. Um, that would have been one of the only reasons why you wouldn't have given TPI, I think. Yeah. Yeah, to me, and that gets back to the, and maybe his risk of bleeding was 30 or 40 percent. You know, here you've got a guy, you're right, you have a large stroke insult. We can see that. If we do nothing, there might be a little bit of improvement with time, but there's usually not drastic improvements. So we know if we don't do anything and he doesn't bleed and we're stuck with whatever issues he had, he's going to be, you know, lots of paralysis, he's not going to talk, he's going to be traked and pegged in a hospital bed somewhere, versus let's try the TPA, where ideally we get 100%, but even if we got 50% back, that'd be great, improve quality of life. Remember, when we go to CT, we're just looking for bleeding, so it's not going to show, especially in an acute stroke, it won't show the area of the brain, so that's like he was saying, it's kind of that you're weighing, and when you're 43, it's kind of outweighs any risk involved. In the, the rhythm when the guy arrived at the hospital, you said it. He's a fifth. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, that's probably classically, a, it's probably undiagnosed, or did he have a history of it? Yeah. No history. So he probably had an undiagnosed AFib, a flutter, and had a atrial clock, and finally threw it. And it was significant size. And If you're suspecting stroke, would you delay transport and do a 12 lead, or would you just load and go? No, I'd go. Because, you know, at this point, that kind of takes second kilter. I mean, they may need something done to that AFib with RVR, but their blood pressure is fine. If anything, it's too high. So, like, by the time that patient got to me in the ER, I'm not going to probably do anything with their AFib because we need to decide what we're going to do about this clot right now. That's what's going to you know, have the negative outcome right away. People walk around with AFib for days. All right, case study three. Arrived to find a 76-year-old female that family states while she was walking, she fell to the floor. Family helped her up and placed her in a chair, which they noticed that she was having slurred speech and her mouth was drooping to the left. She is noted to have no movement to the left arm when asked to do it. So arm drift, that's a yes. Facial droop, yes. Slurred speech, yes. So uh, she is yes on all three, so that is definitely a positive Cincinnati stroke scale. 
history, she has CHF, hypertension, diabetes, and some cardiac stents. Assessment, her airways patent, breathing is normal. Circulation, strong regular radio pulse. LOC is A, no to person, place, and time and event. Hemiplegia to the left side and no uh, blood loss. Vital signs, blood pressure 168 over 120. Pulse 80, respiration is 14, sats 98% of Romer. Uh, pupils are four and reactive, blood sugar 206. On ED arrival, blood pressure 207, 135. Pulse 84, respiration 16, sats 98%, no change in pupils. Cincinnati strokes go positive. Their impression, A and O times 4. Looking up and to the right, which you cannot change. Uh, left sided facial droop with drooling. Uh, she has no grip strength to the left and is unable to move the left leg. Slurred speech is noted. All right, what kind of treatment are we going to do? Oxygen? Okay, the uh, cannula or non breather? Cannula? Okay. IV, we're going to do fluids or an INT? Okay. How about a cardiac monitor? 12 liter, just monitor. 12 liter, let go. Let go, I like that too. 12 liters, welcome. All right, spinal mobilization. She did fall. Full or just C collar? Uh, <laughs> that's good. That's a very good point. Don't need to be lying flat. I mean, uh, the family helped her up with assistance. <laughs> so I think we can justify this one. If you did anything, a C collar at semi fowlers to justify a possible CVA, I think, Dr. Chalmers, you'd be okay with that? <laughs> Transport priority, is this a code one or code three? Okay, remember, onset of symptoms was just prior to EMS being called, correct? Because everything happened, she was walking when she fell, so everything <laughs> happened right there, okay? Uh, the outcome of this one, y'all think, what are y'all thinking? That's probably him Okay. No intracranial hemorrhage on CT. Uh, TPA initiated uh, 85 minutes from arrival. She. The patient's weakness and facial droop improved during the hospital stay and the MICU team continued to monitor and, uh, the patient. Uh, initially, the patient uh, was very hypertensive. Uh, afterwards, she was successfully tapered off uh, cardiac drip. Afterwards, uh, neurology recommended initiation of aspirin, which was done without problems. The patient initially uh, failed swallow evaluation by a speech therapist, but uh, eventually passed. PT, OT, initiated physical therapy and recommend placement in SNF. What is SNF? Skilled nurse. Skilled nurse facility. Thank you. Which was refused by family. Uh, the patient was discharged home with family. Uh, on discharge, the patient was alert and oriented, able to follow commands. Although improved, the patient continued to have weakness. Three out of five to the left arm, four out of five to the left leg and the right side of the body was 5-5. Five, five. So, is good outcome? Absolutely. Kind of, when I read this one and got the results, I was, I was a little, I thought hemorrhage myself. Simply the fact that she was all three. I thought, my gosh, better, you know, for the documentation, the pupils were okay, but that doesn't, you don't go off just pupils. So I was a little shocked by this one when I read the report on this one. Any, anyone, anything on this one? What was her LLC? The one? 
believe it was completion of the Lark Yeah. Yeah. The Lark oriented first place time. She just couldn't speak. And GC, what was the GCS? The, one, the only thing, the one thing I've noticed on a lot of these is when they're aphasic or they're unable to speak or we find them down, we end up, this is not necessarily always the stroke scale that's positive, but our GCS will be 7 or 8 um, because we're taking, we're on the verbal piece of the GCS, which the GCS was developed for trauma. I um, mean, that's your overall LOC. So that's just one thing to kind of think about, too, is when you're thinking of stroke and they're aphasic, I would just knock it off, in my opinion, I would knock it off of the on your Cincinnati and not your overall GCS. What do you think, Dr. Chalmers? Yeah, no, I think, so the GCS was originally created for neurosurgical trauma, like you said, some kind of head trauma, but it's kind of morphed into medicine. We just use it for everything. I mean, just like this, people use it in sometimes in stroke type patients and it's that wasn't its intention and I agree when you're really a non-trauma we still use GCS but certainly in stroke you know we don't really base what we're going to do like oh their GCS is 12 let's get TPA that's we never say that and we're basing this off Cincinnati as a stroke scale so I don't know I mean I hate to say don't mention it but Hopefully everybody can kind of understand it's not really the mainstay of what we use for making a decision on stroke. Kind of makes sense. I guess when we're just, I guess just because when you're not too, it is like we'll say we'll have a positive for arm drift, positive for facial droop, but then we'll have a negative speech because they're aphasic. But yet then we'll have a GCS of seven. Does that make sense? So it's almost like we're substituting, it's obviously a stroke if you're going to call it a it's a positive Cincinnati, <coughs> but we're not calling aphasia because it's not slurred speech. Does that make sense? Gotcha. Where you're saying it should have been positive on the speech. Yeah. No, I think you're right there. I've just seen that on the few, so that's why I just made yeah. mention of it. One thing I found, uh, you know, on the impression that talked about it a little bit, but not as much. But, you know, patients' eyes are looking up and to the right and she is unable to move them away from that direction. So I thought that was just strange. That's, when I read it, that's why I thought it was hemorrhage. But I guess get tricked. Okay. Case study number four. Arrived to find a 68-year-old female sitting in a chair with family members. She is conscious but does not respond when asking questions. Family states that she has history of CVA four years ago, which left her with some right-sided weakness. She can normally talk and function with no problems. This started one hour prior to EMS being called. That was another thing that uh, you know we talked about in the medical protocol update. We'd really like to start seeing people put what time in your report exactly the patient was last seen normal uh, or if not time how long ago 30 minutes ago 45 minutes ago uh, arm drip yes facial droop yes speech unable to assess due to not uh, able to speak which is new and they documented that what you're, what you're saying is that should be yes right yes yeah. that so makes sense go back again okay if they're not talking the speech is Yes. Yes, which in the Cincinnati Stroke Scale on that card I'll show you, we'll look at it again. It says if you if the patient is unable to speak when spoken to, that is considered a yes. That's a matter of saying slur or no speech. Right. Yes. Slurs words, uses the wrong words, or is unable to speak. So that should not be an unable to assess. To me the only reason you really can put that is like this. I mean you can't hear or something. I don't know. Especially when you document which is new. If you're documenting which is new, you're definitely saying that is something, an onset. History CDA four years ago with weakness to the right side of the body and high blood pressure. Assessment the airway is patent, breathing is normal, circulation strong, regular radial pulse, uh, alert and disoriented. Facial droop to the right, unable to move right arm or leg when asked to, and blood loss is none. 
vowel signs and impression. Blood pressure 154 over 86. Pulse of 64, respiration is 18. Pulse ox 96% room air, blood sugar 118. Pupils 2 and reactive. No change in vital signs prior to ER arrival. <coughs> the impression patient, patient is noted to have a new onset of stroke symptoms for the family. Uh, the patient asks if uh, she wants to speak, although when asked to, she cannot. That's a positive sign. She fails arm drift test by not being able to lift her right arm up when asking her to, and the left arm and her left leg, excuse me, the left arm and leg are able to move on commands. Okay, so the crew member documented very well about what their impression was of what they saw. Treatment. Oxygen. NRB or nasal cannula? Who says nasal cannula? Absolutely. Why not? Who would do an honor breather? Nobody? Nobody gives her oxygen at all. IV fluid. IV fluids or INT? What does she need? INT. Blood draw? Cardiac monitor? Is she a transport priority code 1 or code 3? Code 3. Code 3. Okay. Her outcome? So, in this report, um, negative uh, from door to needle time was 54 minutes. On the arrival to the EC, the patient was examined by neurology and determined to be a candidate for TPA. The risk of, uh, on 129, the patient was seen and noted to have improvement and an increase in communication. The patient was able to communicate the need to use the restroom and was asking for food. The patient still had some weakness to the right lower extremity, which was determined to be a new symptom for the patient. So this one had a, a positive outcome. The patient's actually able to ask questions and ask some things. You know, uh, a lot of these outcomes on these patients like this that receive TPA, you know, it comes back to the good treatment that you give in the field of calling a coach stroke and activating the code stroke and the stroke team get in there and the doctor and, and the patient going directly to CT and we have results like this. You know, what I want you to take home, just remember, is if you have a positive in any one of those three on your chief complaint of stroke, arm drift speech, then it has to be a positive Cincinnati stroke scale. And if you have a Cincinnati stroke scale that changes prior to you getting to the hospital, which can happen, just please document and explain why. Okay? Any questions about any of the case studies? I want to mention a, just a few other things. One is, if we have a positive Cincinnati stroke scale, is that automatically a code stroke? What's the other kind of piece to that? Onset three hours or less. Right, definitive establishing the onset. You know, remember if grandma woke up this morning and she's not moving her left side, well, when she go to bed, well, she just laid down for a nap 30 minutes ago. That's sure. potentially code stroke. She went to bed last night after the news, not a code stroke. So that's something that we got to remember. The other thing I wanted to ask, I know we changed, uh, it's been, I don't know, six, eight months ago about the whole straight to CT thing, because I know everybody said they did that at Covenant. We weren't doing it at UMC. How's that going? It's worked really well. It works well. And it's reflected in our numbers, that's for sure. Good. It's also helped to position the bedside time tremendously. Yeah, I mean, I haven't heard anything negative from nursing staff or physician staff here. It's uh, that's been just kind of something. nothing but golden for us on that. Good. <clears throat> that's all I had on that. Dusty, do you remember this call? Mm-hmm. You want to come up here and talk about it? Um, we were called to the high school. It was late in the evening. Let's see, uh, 652? Yeah. Um, it was a teacher with some students in the classroom still at that time. I don't know what for. Uh, it took us some time to get them to actually find them because they didn't know where. We were actually dispatched to the other side, running around to find him. 
said he was sitting in the chair, um, called some students out to say he just didn't feel good, kind of slumped out of his chair to the ground. Uh, we found him. He had complete, complete left side of the, I think it was left side, wasn't it? Uh, I think it was left side of the paralysis. No reflex at all. Um, he was very hypertensive. 230, I think, was our first palpated blood pressure. Uh, loaded him up, moved, was moving the truck. He had an episode of emesis. Uh, gave him some Zofran. That stopped him. Um, we kind of just maintained his airway with basic maneuvers. Uh, went straight to CT, had a positive bleed. Um, I think I gave him 10 of the beta law. Had a minor decrease in blood pressure, but it was transit. It came right back pretty quick. Uh, I think on the C in CT room, I think his blood pressure was still 270 something. That's uh, so systolic. Um, that's about as far as I know. Yeah. I can pretty much put that. Stay here if you want to. The one thing, I, whenever I read this report, when I was pulling up strokes and stuff, I was looking at this report, and I, I mean, that is some good documentation. I mean, that is some great documentation. He, he documents very well about everything, each section where that guy had problems. And, you know, I think he did a good job on that. Uh, his vital signs were documented very well. Uh, his impression of what he saw was documented very well. They called and got orders for Levade law, you know, pressure's 270 over zero. You know, that may, you know, is going to hurt him. We don't know. All we know is his blood pressure's high. So I think you did a really good job on this report. Do you have anything to comment on this, Dr. Trout? I completely agree. This, uh, there was a lot of information in there, and it was all useful information. It's very good. So, one thing that we decided to start doing in the training department is when somebody turns in a report of this caliber that's this well detailed I mean just that's a really good report we decided that we're gonna put our own money in and you're gonna get report them up for it and there's you a movie card to take you and your family out so you can get some family time thank you you're welcome congratulations